Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Writing Cabin with Tara Benner. I'm fantasy author Tara Benner, and this is my cabin. We all need to escape into story from time to time. So come on in, sit down by the fire, pour yourself a nice hot cup of coffee, and let's talk books. Now, today, in place of our regular show, I am doing a very special recording of The Fay Hunt Part 3. This is a novella I wrote for my patrons. It has never been published anywhere else other than my Patreon, and I am serializing it for the podcast and my YouTube channel. So if you missed the last two episodes of The Writing Cabin, go back and listen to Parts 1 and 2. This novella does contain some spoilers for um, Hunter's Witch and Warrior Witch. And so if you haven't read that far, uh, maybe read those before you listen to this audiobook. Now, without further ado, here is The Fay Hunt Part 3. Gabriel fumed in tense silence the entire drive back to Mountain Shadow. He consistently kept his speed ten miles over the speed limit, which made Fiona's stomach fly into her throat as they whipped around the hairpin turns that wound around the outcroppings of boulders that dotted the open fields. He used the short straightaways to speed past other vehicles, mostly dirty SUVs and RVs headed back from a weekend of camping. Fiona glanced over at him a few times, only to find his jaw popping as he ground his back molars together. I'm sorry, said Fiona, once her stomach had returned to its proper position after a particularly nasty curve. For what? For getting involved with Miss Amelia and drawing Balok's attention to you. It's not your fault, said Gabriel, staring out at the open road. Balok didn't come after me because of something you did. How can you be sure? You heard Gunter. He's been waiting for the perfect opportunity for a while, and he finally got his chance. Fiona frowned. She knew the Fae hated all hunters, but Gabriel's territory had included Denver. He'd hardly had time to come poking around in Mountain Shadow. She doubted he ever made it up to Lake George to bother the old Fae. Why would Balak be so invested in killing you? Up until ten minutes ago, you didn't even know who he was. Gabriel didn't respond right away, but the tips of his knuckles whitened on the steering wheel. For a moment, Fiona thought he'd become too consumed by his own frustration to hear a word she said. But then he let out a heavy sigh and gave a short shake of his head. Because I'm the one who pissed off the Fay, back when I still lived in Denver. I knew it was dangerous, leaving things unfinished. I just didn't think it would follow me here. Fiona had spent enough time with Gabriel to know it was useless to push him. He always revealed more when she gave him time, so she waited for him to elaborate. A few years ago, I got a really strange phone call from a light elf I'd once had a run-in with. She'd heard about a changeling that had been left at Rose Medical Center, and she wanted me to go investigate. Fiona drew in a shuddering breath. At first, I thought it had to be some kind of trap. I hadn't heard of the Fae kidnapping a mortal child since the 17th century. There were a lot more of them back before the Brotherhood's purge of Scotland and the British Isles, and they were bolder back then. The elves don't exactly love my kind either, but I went there anyway. Turns out, the tip was credible. Gabriel blinked twice very fast, and his shoulders trembled in a full-body shudder. I heard its cries before I even made it to the ward. He glanced at Fiona with a dark expression. They weren't the cries of a human baby. They were the cries of something not of this world. The mortal infant had been kidnapped, taken to Elfheim, the land of the Fae. It had been replaced with this evil thing. Fiona waited with bated breath. The thought of her child being taken shortly after birth and replaced with a changeling was almost too horrible to fathom. I didn't trust my senses at first, so I hung around the nurse's station to see if anyone had noticed anything odd. To a hunter, to any supernatural, it's usually obvious that a changeling is not a normal baby. Changelings are grotesque, deformed, and evil-looking. But to mortals, even the most observant, a changeling will just seem slightly off. And had they noticed? Fiona whispered. 
they noticed something was wrong with the baby. They thought it had been exposed to drugs in the womb. The mother was only 17, and they were giving her a really hard time. There was talk of calling in CPS. I felt really sorry for her. What did you do? Gabriel gave a bitter shake of his head. What could I do? There was no sign of the fae who'd taken the baby, and I knew she wouldn't return. She'd gotten what she'd come for, and now this poor mortal girl was about to be swept up in the system, fighting for a child that would never be... right. He looked over at Fiona, and she could see the naked sadness beneath his anger. Changelings don't ever fully adapt to our world. Sometimes they'll come to love their human parents, but most of the time they are difficult children who grow into mean-spirited adults. I could see the life that young mother had ahead of her, and so I tried to find the Fae responsible. And did you? Fiona asked. Gabriel nodded. I tracked her down near Decker's. She was headed for a portal back to Elfame. It was pretty common knowledge in the Brotherhood that there was a portal somewhere in the area, though we'd never been able to find it. I tracked her there, but she didn't go without a fight. Mortal children, however they're stolen, are treated like royalty among the Fae. The Fae will protect them at all costs. There was a long, bleak pause, and Fiona's inkling that this story did not have a happy ending morphed into a terrible certainty. The Fae escaped with the baby, and I couldn't follow her. Mortals and most supernaturals can't go to Elfame, not if they ever hope to return. So what did you do? Gabriel's eyes grew cold. I destroyed the portal so that no Fae could ever use it again. It was the last portal they had in Colorado, maybe in all the Southwest. I can't be sure. But it was also a site the Fae considered sacred, and I knew they would seek retribution. That explained why Miss Amelia had jumped at the chance to lure Gabriel into the forest. It didn't explain why Gabriel seemed so disturbed by the magpie's determination to mete out revenge. She'd always known Gabriel to relish a fight. A game of cat and mouse should have excited him, even if he was the mouse. One thing you have to understand about the Fae is that when they steal a child, they feel that child is theirs. The fact that I tried to take the baby away from her, well... Gabriel glanced at Fiona again, and she knew there was something he'd left out on purpose, something he didn't want to admit. The Fae are a cruel but poetic species. Now that Balok knows about you and... Gabriel broke off with a tight swallow. I'm not sure he'll be content with just killing me. Fiona let out a heavy breath, simultaneously terrified and relieved. On the one hand, the thought of having a child ripped away and replaced with a changeling was too horrific to consider. It showed a level of cruelty that was utterly unimaginable. On the other hand, understanding why Gabriel was so disturbed by Balak gave her some measure of relief. She'd been so absorbed in Gabriel's story that she didn't notice they were back in Mountain Shadow until he pulled up in front of Wesley's house. He killed the engine and got out of the car, freezing with the door still open. Fiona heard the loud clatter of a bird, followed by another. She glanced out the window into Wesley's front yard and saw a swarm of birds gathered on the lawn. They were big, black and white things with long, graceful tail feathers and blue and green plumage on their wings. They had sharp, black beaks and seemed unhurried as they pecked around in the grass. Magpies. Gabriel's mouth hardened into a thin line, and he strode purposely across the yard to the front door. The magpies squawked and flapped as he passed, but they didn't fly away. Fiona watched as Gabriel thrust the front door open and put his finger between his lips. Fiona heard his loud whistle, followed by the scrape of claws. A second later, the colonel came bounding out the front door and became airborne as he flew from the porch. The colonel was Wesley's German shepherd, and though Fiona had spent plenty of time around him, she'd only ever seen him in the house or on a leash. Running loose, he was a sight to behold, especially as he made a beeline for the horde of magpies. The birds took flight in an ungainly flap of wings, and the colonel snapped his jaws with relish. He didn't catch one, but Fiona wasn't sure if that was because he couldn't or because he enjoyed the sport of the hunt more than the kill itself. Gabriel watched the birds fly away with a hint of foreboding in his gaze. Magpies were common in Colorado, but Fiona didn't think they were there by coincidence. 
her mind went to the demonic doves that had gathered outside her kitchen window. She knew it was completely ridiculous, but she couldn't help but feel that Balak was using the birds as his spies. Fiona left Gabriel to go check on her new part-time clerk. The werewolf girl she'd hired to help out the apothecary was working out well, but Saturday was their busiest day, and Fiona didn't like leaving her alone. As it turned out, her instincts had been spot on. A huge group of tourists from Georgia had descended upon the apothecary, and it was all the poor girl could do to hold down the fort. After closing up shop for the night, Fiona trudged home to get ready for dinner with Gabriel. She was dead on her feet, but she was still excited for their date. Between the murders in Mountain Shadow, the demons, and the bounty on her head, the two of them had hardly had any time to do the normal things people did when they were dating. He'd made reservations at Sophia's that night, and Fiona had been looking forward to it all week. By the time she got home, she just barely had time to hop in the shower, slink into her dress, and smear on some mascara and lip gloss. Sophia's was easily the nicest restaurant in town. It wasn't formal by any means, but she always liked to dress up when she was there. She went downstairs to wait for Gabriel, but 6.45 came and went. It was strange. Whether they were scheduled to work out or go on a date, Gabriel was always on time. Fiona paced around the kitchen nervously, putting away dishes and wiping down the island with a rag. She knew he wouldn't have stood her up. It would be difficult living right next door, and his car was parked outside. If they didn't leave for the restaurant soon, they would miss their reservation. So Fiona grabbed her purse and walked through the gate to Wesley's yard. Wesley had already left for work, and Fiona was grateful she wouldn't have to talk to him before heading out on a date with his brother. She raised her hand and knocked on the door, which flew open almost at once. Sorry, said Gabriel, looking uncharacteristically flustered as he tucked down the collar of his leather motorcycle jacket. I got caught up in what I was doing. I guess I lost track of time. Fiona frowned at him. Gabriel was punctual, almost to a fault. He didn't ever lose track of time. She glanced behind him into the living room, where a lamp illuminated the beat-up coffee table that was a relic from Wesley's college days. The table was plastered with all sorts of maps, with big red circles all over them. Gabriel saw what she was looking at and gave a sheepish shrug. Maps of potential fey activity from the last five years. I thought maybe I could narrow my search, but there's no pattern to the activity. Fiona didn't know what to say to ease his mind, so she just threaded an arm through his and steered him down Windchime Lane. Given that they were running late, they probably should have driven. But it was a beautiful night, the restaurant was close, and she thought the walk might do him some good. The cool night air always helped her clear her head. She leaned against him as they strolled, reveling in his warmth and solidity. As it was the peak of summer tourism season, Main Street was still busy. The shops were closed, but the bars and restaurants were still in full swing. A small crowd was gathered outside the Fireside Cafe, waiting for an open table. Fiona could see Daphne bustling around on the patio, hovering over her waitstaff and checking on the food. As they walked up, Gabriel stopped and stiffened. He was staring at a gentleman by the door, looking as though he'd seen a ghost. The man was of average height and build, if a bit tubby around the middle. He had a neatly trimmed white-gray beard and was wearing a Hawaiian shirt with cargo shorts and Crocs. What's wrong? Fiona asked. Gabriel didn't answer her right away. He just continued to stare. She knew he wasn't looking at the man's Crocs. He had the look of a hunter on the prowl. Fiona gave his arm a tug, trying to break his trance. Gabriel, what? It's him, he rumbled. There, outside the restaurant. Fiona followed his gaze back to the man. He might have borne a passing resemblance to the Fae, but it was most definitely not Balak. This man had a much rounder face and a bulbous nose. He was with a petite woman with an upturned nose and dyed blonde hair. The two of them were certainly mortal. It's not him, said Fiona gently, giving Gabriel's arm a tug. I don't sense any Fae either. Do you? The muscles in the back of Gabriel's neck tightened but he didn't break his stare. He was glaring so hard at the man in the Hawaiian shirt that Fiona was stunned the mortal didn't feel his gaze. Eventually, Gabriel's trance broke, and he gave his head a little shake. 
He must have come to his senses and realized the man wasn't Fay, and they continued up the street toward Sophia's. They were 15 minutes late for their reservation, and Giovanni had given away their table. His tiny restaurant was completely packed, but somehow he managed to conjure them a table. Fiona was somewhat of a regular there, and Giovanni always went the extra mile to provide the very best experience. Gabriel was jittery and distracted all through the appetizer, and when Fiona's goat cheese and fennel salad came, she found she could scarcely enjoy it. She tried to keep the conversation light, but Gabriel would only answer in short, grunty sentences. He purposely sat with his back to the window as hunters tended to do. Normally, Gabriel's vigilance didn't bother Fiona, but he kept scanning the restaurant and the street behind her, which she found distracting. By the time Fiona's mushroom pepper deli arrived, she was ready for the night to be over. Maybe it was something about Sophia's itself, but this was her second botched date at the restaurant. If she didn't get her love life together, Giovanni would think there was something seriously wrong with her. Gabriel paid for their meal and got up to leave, taking Fiona by the hand. He held it tightly as he led the way down the narrow aisle, shielding her with his body. But just as they reached the door to the restaurant, Gabriel whipped to the left and stiffened. He was staring at the middle-aged waiter as though he were facing down his mortal enemy. There was a brief pause as he registered the threat. Then he tugged her close and hissed, Run! Fiona's mouth fell open. What the hell was wrong with him? He was staring at the waiter who'd been working at Sophia's for as long as she could remember. The man had salt and pepper hair, olive skin, and a handlebar mustache. Seeing Gabriel standing stiffly by the door, the waiter turned to him with a smile. Thank you for coming, sir. Oh, no. Thank you. Gabriel's voice came out as a growl, and he reached instinctively into his jacket. Fiona saw where this was going and only had a split second to react. Diving around Gabriel's tall, hulking body, she took her hand and used it to pin his arm against his chest. She stretched up on tiptoe and planted a kiss, a full-mouthed, wet, sloppy one right on his lips. Gabriel stiffened and tried to push her away, but Fiona didn't release his hand. He couldn't pull a gun in a restaurant full of people, and it wasn't like Gabriel to try. Hunters were smart, strategic, and calculating. They didn't just fly off the rails and endanger innocent people. It's not him, Fiona hissed, meeting his gaze as she pulled away. Gabriel's dark blue eyes were wide and alert. Then they flickered behind her to the waiter, who was smiling indulgently. The waitstaff at Sophia's had seen every flavor of romance. Candlelit proposals, handsy honeymooners, and even the occasional breakup. The sloppy kiss certainly wouldn't have fazed him. It must have been Gabriel's murderous stare that made him avert his eyes. Let's go, Fiona growled, capturing Gabriel's right wrist so he wouldn't go for his firearm. She tugged him determinedly out of the restaurant, but he didn't take his gaze off the waiter. It wasn't until they were halfway down the street that Gabriel seemed to come back to himself. He shook his head as if to clear it, blinking hard at the ground. What is going on with you? Fiona cried. That guy didn't even look like Balok. I know, said Gabriel with an edge of frustration, rubbing his left ear as though he had water in it. I don't know what happened back there. It's like I'm seeing things. He trailed off on the last few words, and Fiona knew he was ashamed. The pronouncement was more than a little alarming, especially considering that Gabriel was always armed. Fiona wasn't really in the mood to spend the night, not after their close call at the restaurant. What she really felt like doing was taking a hot bath and curling up on the couch in her PJs, but she didn't think it was a good idea to leave Gabriel alone. So she came inside with him and plopped down in front of Wesley's TV while Gabriel pored over his maps. By the time they finally went up to bed, Fiona fell asleep immediately. She woke up twice to find Gabriel hunched at his desk with the maps again, but eventually he crawled into bed. Fiona dreamt about Baylock that night. Everywhere she looked, the old Fay was there, staring at her through the crowd. 
and every time she tried to get near him, Balok would morph into a giant magpie and fly off with a horrible screech. Then she dreamt of Gabriel caught in that mountain mahogany bush. She saw the ether-infused branches wrap around his chest and throat, squeezing until they cut off his airways. She ran over to try to pull the branches away, but the fey ether burned her hands. She watched helplessly as the branches tightened, choking Gabriel until he turned blue. Then she felt the branches around her own neck. They cut into her windpipe, making her gag, and she tried to pull them away. But the harder she tugged at the thick, scratchy branches, the tighter they seemed to dig in. Her chest heaved as she fought for oxygen, but the branches wouldn't budge. No, she realized before she passed out. It wasn't the roughness of the bark she felt. She could discern the mounds of knuckles and the roughness of warm, calloused hands. Fiona awoke with a sudden jolt, and her whole body stiffened with terror. Gabriel was straddling her on the bed, holding her down as he choked her. It was such a strange sight that it didn't immediately sink in, so it took Fiona a second to react. It was too dark to see Gabriel's expression, but she sensed a strange sort of absence around him, as though he wasn't completely in charge. Fiona fought to choke his name, but she couldn't make a sound. No air could escape her throat, and she couldn't draw in a breath. She slapped frantically at Gabriel's hands and even tried to slap him. It was no use. He was too strong. So she dug down with her bones and summoned enough ether to blast him off the bed. Because she'd been panicked and still half asleep, Fiona's control wasn't good. Instead of just enough force to throw him off her, she sent Gabriel flying across the room where he hit the opposite wall. The thud he made was loud enough to wake the dead, and the ceiling fan shook on impact. He crumpled to the floor in a stunned heap, but his days didn't last long. Gabriel sprang to his feet almost immediately, and Fiona shrank away from him. In the small slice of moonlight falling across the bed, she caught the horrified look in his eyes. Oh my god, are you alright? Did I hurt? I'm fine, Fiona rasped, feeling the sting of the words as she spoke. She tried experimentally to clear her throat, but it felt as though she had a thousand paper cuts in her airways. Gabriel ran out of the room, and she heard the tap running in the bathroom. He reappeared with a glass in hand, water sloshing over the side. He handed it to her, and Fiona tried to drink, but her swallowing reflexes weren't working correctly. I'm so sorry, Gabriel repeated. I, I don't know what came over me. I was dreaming, and it's the Fay. Fiona croaked. What? Gabriel looked alarmed. Fay, Magic. The words cost her dearly coming out, and still Gabriel looked confused. Fiona could sense the fey ether then, and was surprised she hadn't felt it at the restaurant. It was subtle, but it was there. Most likely it had been masked by Gabriel's hunter energy, or the ether of so many mortals. Now that she was alert from her brush with strangulation, she could feel the fey ether pulsing in the room. Gabriel clicked on the lamp to examine her throat, but Fiona cringed when he reached for her. She saw his blue eyes crinkle in pain, and she tried very hard to relax. She wasn't afraid of Gabriel, not really. She just didn't trust him right then when he was clearly under the spell of some weird fey magic. Fiona tried to clear her head as she scanned Gabriel's room, eyeing the pile of maps, the boxes of weapons, and finally landing on the trash can. It was one of those small wicker waste paper baskets that was usually full of discarded bubble wrap and sticky notes. Gabriel had stuffed some thin plastic down into it, and Fiona caught a glimpse of crinkled white paper with Mountain Green Dry Cleaning's logo on it. Where did that come from? Fiona asked suddenly, sitting bolt upright. Where did what come from? The dry cleaning bag. From the dry cleaners? said Gabriel slowly, staring at Fiona as though worried for her sanity. What did you have dry cleaned? My jacket, he said, gesturing at the leather motorcycle jacket that hung over the back of his desk chair. When? I picked it up this afternoon, right after I dropped you. Gabriel trailed off. Clearly he understood what Fiona was getting at. 
Fiona wriggled out from under the covers, and Gabriel ripped the jacket off the chair. He turned it inside out and stared at the lining. Nothing appeared to be amiss. It was a really nice, expensive jacket, the kind with a removable lining for winter. As it was the middle of July, the lining wasn't in, but there were some flaps that zipped into it. Gabriel pulled the left flap aside, and Fiona's blood ran cold. Pinned beneath the flap of fabric was a bundle of black and blue feathers. They were held together with twine and a sprig of dried herbs that Fiona didn't recognize. What she did recognize was the magical energy leeching off the talisman. It was potent fey magic. Snatching the thing out of Gabriel's hands, Fiona tossed it onto the counter. This was the reason Gabriel had been hallucinating, and why he'd tried to kill her. He's messing with you, said Fiona quietly, trying to drive me crazy. Gabriel gave a small shake of his head, his whole body thrumming with anger. I should have known. The Fae love to play mind games. I just didn't think he could get to me. Well, clearly he found a way, said Fiona shakily, staring at the mess of feathers on the floor. There was something eerie about the way the talisman was put together. Something ancient and unmistakably sinister. The feathers looked dirty, particularly around the quill. They were stained with what could have been dirt or dried blood. She had a feeling that these feathers had been ripped off a real magpie not that long ago. A hand-carved bead was threaded around the twine, inlaid with some Celtic symbol. As she sat there staring at the talisman, Fiona had an idea. In his desperation to get to Gabriel, Balak had made a mistake. He hadn't counted on Fiona, or Fiona's friends. He might have gotten to you, said Fiona slowly, but I know how we can get to him. Thank you so much for joining me for part three of The Fay Hunt, a Witches of Mountain Shadow novella. If you are enjoying this story and you just can't wait for next week's episode, you can get the rest of the novella along with all the other unpublished Witches of Mountain Shadow stories when you go to my Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash Tara Benner Labs. Uh, you can also find the rest of my published books on my website, tarabenner.com. And finally, do make sure you subscribe to the podcast or my YouTube channel so you never miss an installment. I so appreciate you being here with me today, and I will see you all next week.